Thank you, Dr. Matacola. So um, we have a couple of minutes. Um, to wrap that up, I just I, I recognize some of the faces here as people who've ridden before. So just by a show of hands, how many people in the audience right now either currently ride or have ridden? Could you raise your hand? Thank you. How many of you had those Calientes and those hunter caps, right? So this is pretty eye-opening. Um, he, in the early uh, part of his talk, I thought, oh, well, that explains why I had seven concussions. I had a caliente. But then when he did the thing about the female jockeys, apparently we're a little top heavy. So 33% of us fall on our head. But uh, I do kind of wish I'd replaced that caliente somewhere along the line. And on a more serious note, my mother was a jockey from 1969 until she had a career ending injury in 1984 and she had brain damage. Um, she lives by herself in Florence, Kentucky. She's okay, don't worry, but she did suffer permanent brain damage both to her long and her short-term memory. And I can only imagine that that Caliente that she was riding with had been with her throughout. So thank you, Dr. Maticola, for that information and the importance of replacing helmets. And by the way, any of you who are still riding, how many want to go out and replace their Caliente or their hunter caps right now, right, with, with one of these other uh, helmets? So thank you for that. Um, our next subject is the equine injury uh, database. So we've, we've heard about the jockey injury database, and now we're going to switch to equines. Um, I think you're going to want to pay close attention as Dr. Tim Parkin. Uh, he has some compelling information to share. And after the presentation, we're going to take a 20-minute break. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Tim Parkin. Uh, he's the senior lecturer and associate um, academic at University of Glasgow. Dr. Tim Parkin is head of the Division of Equine Clinical Sciences and senior lecturer, lecturer in clinical epidemiology at the School of Veterinary Medicine, College of Medical, Veterinary and Life Sciences, University of Glasgow. He qualified from the University of Bristol with degrees in zoology in 1992 and veterinary science. He immediately took up a position at the University of Liverpool and went on to complete his PhD on the epidemiology of fractures in racehorses in 2002. Since then, he has worked on numerous projects with several different racing jurisdictions around the world, including the UK, Hong Kong, Japan, Australia, South America, and the United States. He gained his diploma of the European College of Veterinary Public Health in 2006 and has worked at the University of Glasgow since February 2007. Dr. Parker, Parkin has twice been an epidemiological consultant for Racing Victoria Jumps Race Review Committees, 2005-2008, and is a member of the Equine Injury Database Scientific Advisory Committee in the United States. Please welcome Dr. Tim Parkin to the stage. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, sorry I wrote so much. Uh, so I want to talk to you today about where we're at with the equine injury database. I was here four years ago, I think it is now, um, giving you an update then. And quite a lot has changed. We've gathered a lot more information, a lot more data, as you might imagine. And we're now in a really positive position where we've got a, so much information that we're able to model the uh, data in such a way to be able to produce some predictive models to enable us to see how we may be able to use the information that has been gathered, gathered over the last six to seven years to actually better inform people on the ground as to which horses may or may not be more likely to end up with injury at the end of a particular race. Um, before I start um, with the continuing education theme, I just want to put a little plug out. Um, is there a pointer on this? <clears throat> is there a pointer? Oh, it's this one. Hold on. um, in the UK, we have this um, a thoroughbred health network that we've recently just started, which is very much aimed at uh, turning all the academic information, academic papers that have been produced in the last 20, 30 years on any equine uh, health topic into something that owners, breeders, trainers, vets even, who won't have read those academic papers into easily understandable, digestible bits of information for the, for the industry. Um, it's, as you might imagine, focused on UK uh, personnel at the moment, but that doesn't mean that uh, a lot of the information that we are going to be producing basically from September is not going to be pertinent to racing in this country as well. 
a lot of the topics that we cover in the UK are very similar to those over here. So we have a Twitter handle that's uh, currently, I have a research assistant in the UK who's tweeting like mad at the moment, uh, talking about this summit. Um, but we're developing a network of individuals who will be interested in uh, anything to do with thoroughbred health. Uh, and we're going to essentially turn lots of ac academic uh, papers that many of you will never even have seen or heard of into uh, digestible bits of information for you to use um, in your day-to-day -day lives. Okay. So back to the uh, topic of what we're talking about today. So the equine injury database. So um, what I'm going to talk about uh, are a few things. Uh, just reintroduce you to the EID since 2008, how much data we have give you some raw descriptive statistics, which are those that are published annually on the US Jockey Club uh, website. Um, I'm then gonna talk to you a little bit about modeling of risk factors that we've done, so how we identify those individual variables that increase or indeed decrease the likelihood of injury or fatality of the horse. And then really take the next step, which is, and this is all, th this bit is really the novel bit, and I've gotta um, say, how encouraged I've been by the US situation where we've been able, enabled to take this step and actually use these models to see if we can actually predict uh, with any success uh, which horses we should be interested in prior to a race uh, in terms of their risk of ending up with a fatal or non-fatal injury at the end of that race. And that modeling hasn't really been done in any other racing jurisdictions to date. So I, I really got to praise the US Jockey Club for for enabling us to do that and funding a PhD student uh, across the pond to uh, help us come up with those models. And then I'll just give you a flavor of what uh, is likely to be happening in the next 12 months, uh, as far as we're concerned. <coughs> Some definitions to start off with, which I, I think are critical. Um, a, a fatality, as we determine it, is a, a fatality of the horse within 72 hours of the race. There were some horses in the original uh, equine injury database that we were using in the model that uh, were going out sort of 60, 70, 80 days post-race and then uh, being euthanized subsequent to that. And it was difficult to tie that euthanasia to the uh, race injury. So we, we took a cutoff at uh, three days post-race. Some people say that that's too, too much of a liberal cutoff and we should be a little bit tighter, but nevertheless, that's the uh, cutoff we've taken. All our estimates are now by calendar year. We now got enough data that we uh, essentially dropped the first couple of months. The EID was started in October, November 2008. So we dropped the first couple of months and we really uh, take the EID from uh, January 2009 and we produce by calendar uh, estimates uh, for you to look at. Uh, this is uh, important. We end up with point estimates of what the incidence or prevalence will be on different surfaces or uh, in different uh, uh, age groups and, and race distances. But each of those is, is bounded by what we call a 95% confidence interval. And this tells us how certain we are that that is the true point estimate we have. And any of you that might have seen any of the previous um, talks, any of the previous estimates, will notice today that actually those confidence intervals are becoming tighter and tighter. And that's simply because we have more and more information. We have more and more data, which means we can be now much more certain that the point estimates we're producing are true point estimates. So there's much less uncertainty around those estimates now that we have six years worth of data. And then finally, uh, importantly, we're now producing multivariable models that account for the interrelationship between lots of the risk factors we're identifying. You can only do that when you have substantial amounts of data. And thankfully, we now have significant amounts of data over the last six years to enable us to do exactly what we want to do. So just some raw data statistics, um, <clears throat> and many of you all have seen these data uh, on the US Jockey Club website, and these data come from, cover the full six years, 2009 to 2014, and these are just the point estimates on all uh, surfaces, and then you have turf, dirt, and synthetic. And you can see there is significant difference between the three different surface types, and indeed those differences are now statistically significantly different. And I remember standing here, I think it was four or five years ago, whatever it was, and presenting similar data, but the confidence interval was much wider, and I couldn't stand here and say at that time that actually there was a statistical difference between the incidence of fatal injury on the different surface types. But now I'm happy to say that there's definitely a um, significant difference between the two. You can tell that by the fact that these confidence intervals around these points estimates don't overlap. So we know that there's going to be a significant difference in all those different turf surface types. If we look... Um, 
across uh, the change in uh, incidents across uh, different across all uh, uh, years, for, uh, all surfaces first of all across the years. You can see uh, initially uh, we saw an, uh, uh, an immediate dip, um, probably as um, uh, new racetracks were enrolled into the EID that were a little bit safer than average. Um, there was a good deal of recruitment over those early years uh, into the ID. Uh, but since then, essentially, there's been very little change in the uh, overall uh, incidence of fatal injury uh, across all surfaces. You get slightly different pictures if you look at it uh, by different surface. So this is, these are turf, these are dirt, and this is synthetic. And you see some ups and downs, and you see that the confidence intervals, these bars here, are much wider for turf and for synthetic than they are for dirt. That's simply because we have fewer data points for those two. We know that most of the racing in the, in the US is obviously on dirt, so we're much more confident about these uh, estimates here. And you see this pattern here largely is driven, uh, largely drives this overall pattern because most of the racing uh, is on dirt. And you see some fluctuations, but I'm not reading too much into these fluctuations here. In both tur turf and synthetic, it, it looked like you know, we saw that initial drop, again, probably related to recruitment of new race courses uh, providing data into the EID in the early years. Interestingly, by age, um, and this is something that uh, we battled with 15, 20 years ago, 10, 15 years ago in, in the UK, had this perception that you shouldn't be racing two-year-olds um, and I have to say again and again, it, it's, a, it's a total misperception. Uh, the earlier you start racing a horse, then uh, the better for their long-term uh, career in terms of their bone health. Um, I'm not saying that you should hammer a, a two-year-old uh, uh, too, too frequently, but certainly exercise as an early age is a good thing for a racehorse. And this is borne out by these data here. So if you look at uh, the number of fatalities per thousand starts for two-year-olds is significantly lower than all of these three plus to seven plus horses. These are all very, very similar. No statistical difference between these, but actually these two-year-olds are statistically significantly less likely to end up with a fatality, fatal injury at the end of a race than, than all other ages. And then finally, race distance. And this, is, this was interesting to us in that in the UK, we see a very different pattern. We see an opposite direction where actually longer races are associated with an increased risk of fatal injury. Um, in the US, we actually see the reverse, where actually it's those short six furlong races that are uh, less than six furlong races that show the greatest risk, probably related to speed, but also partially obviously related to the surface that those races take place on. Probably get more uh, short races on dirt, obviously, than you do on the other uh, synthetic and turf tracks, and that's why the multivariable modeling that I'll show later is so important. But um, we think the, the reason we see the difference between the UK and the US is that we have a very different profile of race distance over here. We have very, very few races that are under six furlongs in the UK, Mo and we have very many more races that are much lo more long distance races. So uh, it's probably simply uh, a difference in the uh, profile, uh, and then related to the fact that these uh, very, very short races are very, very quick, uh, and speed is, uh, is an un as yet unmeasured variable we can include, but certainly is likely to have a, a large impact on the likelihood of a horse suffering a uh, fatal injury at the end of a race. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the models that we produce now. Um, and these models um, are important because rather than just look at individual risk factors on their own, uh, which can be confounded by other risk factors and actually can lead you up sort of uh, blind alleys and, and wild goose chases, what's important is that you account for the effect of individual risk factors on each other. So as I sort of uh, related to there, um, uh, this race distance is likely to be related to the race surface. So we don't really know whether it's race distance that's important or whether it's the surface that they're racing on that's important. We saw that dirt presents a greater risk, but also shorter races present a greater risk. So which of those two is more important? Well, modeling these things together enables us to tease out which of the two uh, risk factors is, is actually most important and actually which one should be potentially the target for intervention uh, or modification if we're wanting to do something about uh, the likelihood of horses uh, ending up with a fatal injury. We have uh, developed national models, which cover all data that comes into the EID. And we've got some track-specific models. These are obviously anonymized track-specific models. 
where we've uh, got sufficient data to enable us to have sufficient confidence that we've got st sufficient statistical power to be confident in the uh, results that come out of those models. What we don't want to be doing is doing track-specific models where we have very few data points, and I'm talking probably fewer than 100 fat fatal injuries over the six years, um, because essentially what you can end up with is some um, errors and identify things that aren't really uh, risk factors, and you can start chasing things um, up blind alleys that, that really will end up diverting resource that uh, are unwarranted. So we only really take on track-specific models where we have sufficient data to enable us to do so. But as I said, all of those are anonymized, um, and they're all anonymized in any press release or presentations that we do. <coughs> um, our national models are built using the full six years' worth of data, and we've built national models that cover all races and claiming races only, um, specifically because we had some specific questions about um, uh, purse drops in, or claiming uh, price drops in, in claiming races and, and the purse to uh, claiming price ratios in those, particular raci in, in those particular races. And we know that claiming races are a big feature of, of US racing over here, much more so than they are in the UK. So we felt uh, it was appropriate to build models specifically for that type of race. In addition to that, we have built models that only uh, include horses that have done at least six months of racing. And this enables us to effectively model um, the previous racing history of all horses in the database. Uh, so we can look and see, okay, how many starts have horses had in the last three months, six months, et cetera. If we were to include all horses that had only just started racing, then obviously that would skew the analysis a little bit and uh, we'd end up with horses that literally on their first race would have no record of a previous race, but that's clearly the case because they're in their first race. So we've excluded uh, in some of the models um, uh, all horses that hadn't raced for at least six months. Uh, as I said, we had track-specific models for eight tracks. Um, and as I said, they, they depended on the sufficient number of starts uh, with adequate statistical power. OK, just some raw figures. Um, so we got now in the database 2.2 um, million starts. Each start takes up a row of, our, of the database. Um, it becomes, it, it's, it's not unwieldy, but it, uh, developing, producing the models takes a little bit of time now, but it's, it's not something uh, that is uh, impossible. Uh, it just takes a little bit more time, and, and the same programming and the same coding goes into producing these models. It just, uh, um, we, we just need someone dedicated to, to that particular task. We have more than 150,000 individual horses uh, in the database. And between 2009 and 2014, we have 95% of all starts in North America. So it's a real credit that this is a, a voluntary um, program for the racetracks. And actually, we've reached almost census proportions in terms of what we're actually monitoring. So we can say that actually the national models are likely to be truly representative of the national picture. I've picked out from all the models we've done, I'm not going to go through a different, each a different model or anything like that. It, there are a multitude of, of different risk factors. And in each model, because there's so much power, we identify a lot of risk factors that essentially uh, maybe up to 20, 25 risk factors for each model, some of which have such minute effects because we have such an uh, enormous amount of statistical power that actually they're not really worth talking about. They're not really worth chasing because even if you were to eliminate that particular risk factor, then the impact uh, on the population in terms of the number of horses you might save would be such a minimal impact that actually the resource uh, required to change those things could be better placed elsewhere. So I'm not going to go through all um, risk factors we've identified. We just picked some that we feel are interesting, seem to have a reasonable size impact, and actually are things that we should uh, be considering uh, in future modifications, potentially. And those are uh, previous EID-related injuries, so the occurrence of those, uh, previous appearance on a vet list, Time with the same trainer was a really interesting one that came out in some of the models. Race distance, surface, previous race history, uh, a drop in claim price since the previous race, and then age at first race. So I'm going to go through each of these different uh, risk factors in turn uh, and let you, show, let you see what we've um, identified in terms of uh, impact on the likelihood of fatal injury. So. Um, Previous injuries. So it is important to note that these are the only, these are only EID reported injuries. We don't have the full medical histories of the horses that are reported to the EID. So there's bound to be lots of misclassification in this particular risk factor. There are going to be lots of horses that suffer an injury 
uh, in training or breezing, uh, wherever that may be, that doesn't get reported into the EID. So there's bound to be a lot of misclassification. So, so my hunch is that the actual relationship between previous injury and then subsequent fatal injury and the sort of veterinary side of me and the physiological side of me and the pathological side of me would say that it's likely to be much bigger than we see here. But the fact we already identify it with only the relationship between EID reported injury and then subsequent fatal injury is really important. So essentially for every extra previous injury, non-fatal injury obviously, reported to the EID, the risk of fatal injury during racing increases by 30%. So compared with a horse with no previous EID injury, one, a horse that has a previ one previous EID in injury at any subsequent race down the track, doesn't matter how far down the track that is in terms of time, they're at 30% greater risk, two previous is about 70% greater risk, three previous is about 110% greater risk. What is important though is to note that actually these are very, very small numbers of horses down here that have three previous EID reported injuries. And I'm sure, as I alluded to before, there are many, many horses that will have many out of EID injuries that actually we could really do with getting a hold of. And I think if we were able to include those injuries into the modeling, we'd be able to uh, really start to have an impact on the, uh, the likelihood or identifying those horses that are likely to suffer a fatal injury uh, further down the track uh, in, a, in any particular start. <coughs> this uh, plot is a little bit complicated, but I just want to take you through the text at the top first. So we looked at whether horses were on the vets list. Now we know that vets list um, occur in different states and it's possible for a horse to move from one state where they're on the vet list and go and race in another state. They can't race while they're on the vet list in the same state where they've been put on the vet list, but they can go and race in different states. We looked at this variable in a number of different ways uh, and it makes no difference if we included uh, whether they came off the vet list. So if a horse went onto the vet list and then came off the vet list, that doesn't make any difference to its risk of suffering a, a fatal injury at a subsequent race start. And interestingly, the risk does not return to baseline once they've been on the vet list. So once they've been on the vet list, the best way of us achieving a model that satisfied all the assumptions and was best predictive essentially said, well, a horse actually doesn't return all the way to baseline. So once it's uh, had an injury, it's actually for its lifetime, it's more likely to suffer a fatal injury. Now that might be a little bit difficult to swallow for some of the vets and the trainers in the, in the audience, but in terms of the modeling process, and that's actually the best way of, of developing this thing. Now, I'm sure that as we get more information about the vet list and as, as we um, model this particular variable in different ways, and this sort of message might change a little, but at the moment, this is, this is what we're seeing. Um, having been on the vet list any time in the horse's career increases the likelihood that the horse will suffer a fatal injury for the whole of their rest of their career. But if they've been on the vet list in the previous six months, then actually their risk is more than twofold. So you can see this is an example of a horse like that here. Horse A went on, uh, this is months since started training, uh, racing career along with the x-axis here. Horse A went onto the vet list. Uh, immediately, any starts made in this period here, that horse would be more than two times more, more likely to end up with a fatal injury in any of those particular starts. After six months, as, assuming it doesn't go back on the vet list, presumably at some point here it would have come off the vet list, but I said that actually modeling that and including that information in the, in the uh, model makes no difference to the uh, statistical or predictive ability of the model. Uh, it, after six months, assuming it doesn't go back on the vet list again, then it drops down again, but not down to baseline. So not down to its original risk. It comes down to somewhere around 1.6 times. So 60% increased risk in every future start of uh, ending up with a fatal injury. Uh, and it stays that way for the rest of its career. Uh, this horse didn't go back onto the vet list for at least two years. Uh, horse B, on the other hand here, went through to about 11 months, then came onto the vet list, went up, down, and then up. And then if that went back onto the vet list again, then its risk was taken up to this, this level up here, twofold, more than twofold again. Now you might imagine that actually cumulative uh, vet list occurrences you'd intuitively suspect would actually increase the risk more and more and more. And I think that probably is the case, but I think we just don't have the, um, the fine detail in the vet list information at the moment to be able to tell us that that's definitely the case. So as I said, th this, this sort of 
message may change a little uh, in future uh, once we dig down a little bit more into that bet list information. Importantly, <coughs> there are significant differences between different tracks uh, in terms of this vet list information. And, and we, this probably relates to uh, lots of factors related to the veterinary provision at the different tracks, uh, how rigorous the regulations are with respect to become getting on and off the vet list at different tracks, uh, whether at different tracks individuals put a horse onto a vet list for 14 days uh, 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 and then it, they automatically come off or whether they have to work to get off a vet list and that sort of thing. And of course, obviously, the inherent differences between the individual tracks that we see as well. But you see here, these are two different tracks in this case. So a horse going onto a vet list at track A, uh, its risk actually went up, can go up to about more than two and a half fold, then comes down to baseline. Horse going onto a vet list at track B, actually the risk at, of a horse uh, suffering a fatal injury at that track, having been on the vet list, uh, goes up threefold, but actually that elevated risk only lasts three months, and then it comes down to baseline. Here, this elevated risk lasts for six months. Oh, no, then it doesn't come down to baseline. Then it comes down to a different level, uh, about still about two, 2.3 uh, increased risk of fatal injury, and then it never returned to anything safer than that. So there's lots of different messages in here, uh, and it, Part of this tells us how important it is to, where, where feasible, use a combination of the national model and the individual track models, as I said, where statistically feasible, to best inform what modifications, local modifications, should be put in place to enable a safer racing environment at those individual tracks. Um, time with same trainer was really important. This is not something we've uh, ever looked at before in the UK, or if we have, we've never identified it as being significant. And the first hint we got with this was actually um, when we actually saw how the risk for an individual horse increased quite dramatically for the first race with a new trainer. And that's partly confounded by the fact that that horse is likely to come out of a claiming race, therefore may have some, some issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then we modeled that in a little bit more detail, and actually this variable came out as being sig more important than just being with its first race with a new trainer. And for every extra year or month with a new trainer, then essentially with, with the same trainer, the risk slowly decreases. So that's um, slightly counterintuitive to what we see with respect to age. But regardless of the age of the horse, the longer a trainer keeps the same horse, then the safer that relationship is going to be. And you can understand that because essentially that trainer will know everything about that horse. He'll know everything about the medical history of that horse. He or she will have decided how best to enter that horse into individual races, how to keep A, how to keep performance up, but E, how, B, how to keep uh, the horse safe. Uh, and there's about a 60% difference in risk uh, here. So when a horse first starts with a new trainer, then it's about 60% greater risk compared with a horse that's been with a trainer for four years. And I recognize that there may not be that many horses that stay with the same trainer for four years. Not all horses have a four-year career, but that gives you an idea of the difference in risk. And so um, <clears throat> it's important to note when, you, when a trainer takes on a new horse that she, you're immediately at great, that individual horse is immediately at greater risk simply because you have less knowledge about the background to that individual horse and you need to be a little bit wary about how you enter those horses into, into races. So this is a combination here where we've got uh, surface and race distance on uh, two variables uh, together. Uh, and surfaces are marked here. So you've got green dirt, uh, red turf, and blue synthetic. And for all of those uh, surfaces, then the risk slowly decreases uh, as you get longer races. Um, and they, the, what's important to note here is that uh, these lines aren't exactly parallel. So there's some degree of... Um, what we term interaction here. So there's an interaction between the surface and the, and the race distance that means that actually uh, there are uh, differing degrees of reduction in risk dependent on race distance, dependent on the surface that you're racing on. Um, but you can see that if you wanted to cut across here, it's not always going to be the case that if you compare a very short, it's going to be the case if you compare a very short uh, synthetic race with a, a, a longer dirt race, then actually the risk is relatively equivalent. So it's not as cut and dried as saying dirt is, is worse than, than turf, is worse than synthetic. You have to also include the race distance in those models as well. Um, this is a little bit complicated, and I, um, uh, but 
these are two horses here. Let's just go through horse A, first of all. And this is all about previous race history. And we model this in a number of different ways. I don't know the number of different ways I've asked the PhD student uh, that is funded by the US Jockey Club to model this. He gets really sick and tired of me saying, how about you do this? How about you try this? How about you try that? But it's really important to try and model these things in so many different ways so that you can best uh, be as precise as you can and be as predictive as possible in the models we produce. And here, this is the best iteration we have so far. And we can compare horse A and horse B. And what we do is that every three months, so for every start that a horse makes, uh, we have code that essentially says, OK, how many starts has the horse made in the previous 14 days, 30, 30 days, 60 days, um, and then chunks of those days, so 60 to 90, 90 to 180, 180 to 360 days, and a whole career. Uh, and essentially, then you model all those different variables and you say, OK, is there a particular racing profile that appears to increase the likelihood of uh, fatal injury at the particular start we're modeling? And this horse here. So let's say both of these horses were starting in the same race October the 2nd of last year. Uh, this is their rate, current race date. Um, this horse here has had two races in the last 30, 30 days. Hadn't raced 30 to 60. That doesn't matter. That actually came out as non-significant. It wasn't of critical importance in the models. But importantly, hadn't had any starts uh, uh, between um, uh, 60 and 90 and 90 to 180 days prior to the particular start we're interested in. So it had a long break here, uh, sufficiently long, such that any potential micro damage to the bones, fracture, repair, and that sort of thing, would have had time to do full circle and actually come back to enable the bones to be as strong as they were when the horse went on the break. This horse here, by contrast, has had no starts in the last 30 days. Equally, has had no starts here, but that's non-significant. We don't really, it, for our models, that's irrelevant. And has had plenty of starts in the days uh, 60 to 90 and 90 to 180 prior to the uh, start we're talking about down here. Those two profiles of horses uh, are quite different, as you can see. And actually, this horse here, at this particular start, starting in the same race as this horse here, is about two and a half times greater risk of ending up with a fatal injury in that particular start than this, start, than this horse here. And I think this, this helps us. I think what we can do with this information is give this to trainers. And, and it's not only about um, identifying which horses are at greater risk when they are entered into a race. We can use this information to help trainers potentially say, OK, if I enter that horse into a particular race, is it going to be at greater risk? And actually, if there are alternative races for that particular horse, then actually maybe that figures into race planning and that sort of thing. And I know this may not be top of the agenda and you're deciding which, which races a horse is going to be entered into. But if we can get this sort of um, thought process going, where actually uh, if there are alternative races for horses to be entered into, then actually this is the sort of thing that trainers should be able to get access to, should be able to take into account and increase uh, the, uh, or include in that, that uh, decision-making process, such that essentially we have a, group, a population of horses being entered into races that are inherently safer. So they're less likely to end up with fatal injury uh, in particular starts. <coughs> I said we did some modeling just in claiming races, and, and this is um, one of the things that came out from that. Um, not enormous changes, but essentially uh, a horse has had little change in claiming price since its previous race. So a plus or minus $500 um, uh, is the reference, essentially. Uh, if it's had a drop of between $500 and $10,000, then actually that horse is at 14% greater risk in the current start. If it's had a drop of more than $10,000, then it's about 16% greater risk. Those percentages aren't enormous. And we have cut this, these data in multiple different ways with multiple different sort of uh, cut points to decide, well, you know, and, and this is what came out as best. So we regard this as a moderate drop, and this is a, a large drop. But we did look at whether between $500 and $5,000 was more important. But actually, nothing came out as being more uh, significant than that. Nevertheless, it's a, it's a highly significant variable with a moderate impact. Um, and again, I think you know, it helps us uh, understand that actually we need to do a little bit more digging into the claiming race uh, profile in those particular models to help us understand exactly how we uh, make those particular types of race more safe for horses that are entering those races. Uh, the final risk factor I'm just going to briefly touch on, and um, 
it's a, it's a little bit of a hobby horse of mine, but um, it is uh, this thing about age at first race. So if you start uh, a horse as a two-year-old, then actually that's the reference. And then there's a sequential stepwise process, and I recognize there are going to be very few horses that start racing at this top end here. Um, but you're certainly going to get horses racing as three- and four-year-olds. And obviously we see a much more of this in the, in the UK where we have national hunt racing, where by routine horses will start as three- and four-year-olds. Um, but essentially there's a stepwise uh, increase in risk for every extra year uh, you delay the start of racing for horses here. Uh, and if, for example, if you start with a six-year-old compared to a two-year-old, they're at 60% greater risk. If you start with a four-year-old, they're at 33% greater risk. And that's the important thing is that that extra risk carries through the whole career. So for every start they make, it's not just an individual start, it's for every start that horse makes, they're at that greater risk uh, of suffering a fatal injury. So it really is critical to at least start exercising horses as two-year-olds. If they're going to be a thoroughbred and they're going to be racing, they need to be exercising as two-year-olds, uh, entering a few races, but definitely doing some exercise. Um, we have a lot of store horses in national hunt racing in the UK where they're essentially they're sent out to paddocks and they don't do any sort of work exercise until they're three or four. And they're definitely, there's definitely an increase in risk for the whole of their career uh, for those particular horses. Okay, so that's gone through uh, risk factors essentially. Uh, the, the beauty of what we're trying to do now, um, uh, and we're two years into a PhD uh, funded by US Jockey Club, um, is we're looking at whether we can actually turn these models into something that is predictive. And I just wanted to, this is how we measure how predictive models are. And this graph is a little bit complicated, but uh, this line here is essentially tells us um, if we didn't have a model, we could just toss a coin. So that's, we'd have a 50-50 chance of identifying, if we had two horses, we'd have a 50-50 chance of identifying which of those two horses was likely to end up with a fatal injury. These things here are different types of model that we've produced. Um, the PhD student we have working on this, Stomatis, um, is an applied statistician, and he's run models, all of the models I've talked about, in multiple different ways, slightly different enhanced models uh, with different coding, um, to see whether we can be any more predictive uh, in the uh, models that we produce. Uh, interestingly, however hard he works at producing a slightly different model, stealing modeling from uh, earthquake uh, prediction and this sort of thing, or uh, testing of bridges and that sort of stuff, nothing comes out as actually providing any gr significantly greater improvement in our predictive ability. Uh, these are the lines uh, that come from each of those different models, and there are other models he's produced as well that I haven't put on here. But essentially what, this, uh, what, what we measure in terms of our predictive ability is the area under the curve. So taking everyone back to sort of uh, I don't know, what, uh, higher sort of school maths and that sort of thing. You measure this area under the curve here. This, this area here obviously represents 50%. So that's a, that's a toy, uh, uh, coin toss uh, predictive model. This is, these are how good our models are at the moment. So, and that area there represent about, represents about 65%. So at the moment, we're, we can, if we've got two horses, we can be 65% certain that we're going to pick the right one that's likely to end up with a fatal injury. And um, we can talk about whether that's of use uh, uh, later on. Um, in many of these models, when we're looking at ROC curves, as these are called, then actually the ideal curve would go straight up here and straight across here, and you'd have 100% predictive ability. But that never, ever happens. We're talking about here a diagnostic test, essentially, to enable us to better predict or better identify horses of, of interest. We get excited in ROC curve, sort of area under the curve analysis, when we get up to the sort of 75, 80%. So at the moment, we're some way off that. But I think there are a lot of different reasons for that, and I'll talk through some of those uh, in a minute. Interestingly, it's not all bad news. Uh, if you look here, this is uh, the predictive ability uh, for different models. So this is the 2010 model trying to predict 2011. And these are three different modeling processes. But you can see the trend. This is 2011 trying to predict 2012, 2012 trying to predict 2013. And this is uh, 2010 to 12 trying to predict 2013. And we've got the next one in process at the moment trying to predict last year's uh, data. And we expect it to be slightly improved again. But essentially, the trend here is that these models are becoming slowly, slowly a little bit more predictive as we add more and more data, as we add new variables into the model. 
we should be getting to a stage where actually we're, we're better able to predict which horses are, are of interest. But so the models are becoming more predictive, but I don't want to over-egg the situation and say that actually we're beca we can definitively say which horses are likely to end up with fatal injury. <coughs> Interestingly, we, we, I got Stamatis, um to do this just the other day, to look at the, uh, I said we had eight different tracks that we'd done specific models for. Um, and the area under the curve, so the predictive ability varies quite a lot at different tracks. And as we'd expect, it's lower for most of those tracks because we have obviously much less information about those tracks. But for uh, one of those tracks, it's actually uh, a, lot, a little bit higher. Um, and I think that's partly because we get quite a lot of good local information from that particular track that helps us dig down a little bit into uh, the specific things that go on on that track. I think a very good vet list and that sort of thing that helps us be quite predictive at that particular track, a little bit better predictive. But it is, we have to recognize there are bound to be a lot of local factors that simply are missed by the EID um, or not recorded at all. Never make it to EID or never recorded on the track itself. Uh, but it does underline the importance of local knowledge and how we, uh, or the US Jockey Club, has to work with the national model we produce, the track-specific model, and then go and talk to the individual tracks and say, well, actually, this is what we know. Tell us what you know, and let's talk together about actually how we uh, modify the risk on your individual track. Understanding something about the local knowledge uh, at those different tracks is critical and certainly shouldn't be underestimated. Um, overall, <clears throat> These are, again, three different model types here, so you don't really need to worry about the detail, but I want to just focus on here. This is essentially the average risk for a horse. This is split up into risk percentiles, um, but this is the average risk for a horse, so this is a hovering around one. The top 5% of horses at risk, so the top 5% of starts, they produce overall about a threefold greater risk of fatal injury um, uh, for those horses that fall into those categories if they fit the criteria that would put them into that category of being in the top 5% of risk uh, in our models. And we pick really the top 5% of starts because essentially if you've got 100 horses entered in a day, then actually it's not unfeasible for vets on the ground to potentially uh, spend a little bit more time, a little bit more resource with five of those horses to identify their fitness to race. Equally, that's gonna be um, likely to be minimally um, disruptive to race entries and that sort of thing for trainers. If they are entering 100 horses over a month, actually if there are five of them, that may be questionable about, actually finding new races for those five horses is not gonna be too disruptive to those individual trainers. So these horses are about threefold greater risk. So I, I will ask a question in a minute and things for you to ponder. Is that useful information? Is it useful to know that those horses are threefold greater risk or do we need to do better? We can try and do better, we are really draining the data as much as we can. And we're trying to get access to as much data as possible. But, you know, I, I recognize we need to do as, as well as we can, but that's kind of where we're at at the moment. So how close are we at being able to more accurately find horses of interest before they race? Well, we, we're kind of getting there. But um, at the moment, our models are topping out around 65%. It may be that that's best possible. Un it's very unlikely that that's definitely the case because that would mean that 35% of the variability in the outcome is totally unpredictable, which I just don't believe. I, I think that's uh, totally uh, not the case. There are bound to be unmeasured variables that we haven't taken into account. We've, and there are tons of them. You think about um, the detailed training records of the horse, uh, the medical records of the horse, veterinary records of the horse, the health status and that sort of thing, things that we just don't have access to that are bound to be uh, associated with risk. Uh, and there is bound to be some inherent variability, um, unmeasured variable, unmeasurable variables that we will never be able to uh, tackle. So I'm, we're never going to get to 100% here, but I'm sure that we can improve on this by including other variables in the models. Um, the other thing we can do, this, this is obviously modeling um, fatal injury, which is a, 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 a relatively rare, thankfully relatively rare occurrence. We could improve our prevalence outcome, the prevalence of the outcome we're interested in by looking at injuries or triage uh, status two plus. Uh, we could, uh, alternatives we could keep with the analysis from all tracks, or we could focus on tracks with available training data. And we, we, we now have some work data that we're gonna be modeling. We've got four, th four million rows of, of work data that Stomatis is, uh, the PhD student, is gonna be working through over the summer to add into these models uh, to 
help us produce some better predictive ability. Now, the trouble with those data is they may, they may have missing data, they won't cover every horse, um, but certainly if we identify that they're critical to modeling in certain states, then we can recommend that that sort of information should be included uh, in other states. And then finally, um, the availability of medical and treatment records we believe is critical. There's lots of work we've done in the UK with the BHA records and work from the vet list and the previous injuries that we presented clearly demonstrates understandably an association with previous injury and then subsequent risk of fatal injury. So our further analysis is going to include uh, things like number of times on the vet list, uh, work to get off the vet list versus automatically getting off the vet list. We need to know that, uh, how individual states deal with that situation. Types of previous injuries we're going to be looking at, we're going to be just some text mining, where that information is available. So if they've had a previous injury that is located to the fetlock, we would automatically assume that those horses are mo more likely to end up with a, a lateral condylar fracture, the most common type of fracture, uh, or a biaxial, biaxial sesamoid fracture uh, uh, of that region uh, that's going to uh, uh, end up in euthanasia with that horse. So we're going to be doing a little bit of detailed analysis of that. Uh, we're going to split, uh, try to look at scratches a little bit more detail, uh, split vet scratches and trainer scratches. Uh, length of meat is something that has come up that we want to really delve into. The pressure that some trainers are bound to feel to get a horse into a final race, one more race before the meet closes. Is that pressure then uh, increasing the risk in cert for certain horses to, um, uh, to end up with a fa fatal injury at the end of that particular start? As I said, we've got some fast work data models that are going on. And then <clears throat> something else that Stomatis is doing over the next couple of months is, is looking at the national model and seeing how predictive the national model is on individual tracks. And actually, is it worth producing individual track models? Are they more predictive than the national model, or should the national model just be rolled out? So final, so some things for us to ponder, really, uh, with you. What do we do with this information? Is a threefold difference in risk important for you to be aware of? A threefold risk uh, compared to the average horse. So some horses are at threefold greater risk than the average horse. Obviously, they're about sixfold greater than the lowest risk horses. And then which, uh, which outcome would be best to embed within the automatic risk profiling for each start? So is fatality, it's clearly important, but it's rare. We want to look at injury or triage two plus. It's important as well. Many of these horses on different days or under different circumstances could have ended up as a fatality. Um, but case definition is going to include a lot of variation coming from lots of different vets around the country. Um, one thing we're going to focus on in the next couple of months is uh, fracture of the distal limb, be slightly more specific with the cause of fatal injury, so we can actually look at those fetlock-related injuries. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, everyone at the US Jockey Club who helps enormously with uh, provision of data and, 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 and uh, insight into how racing works over here and, and, and helps us understand how we should best model everything we do uh, in, uh, back in Glasgow. And Stomatis, who's... Uh, uh, he's, a, he's, as you can tell from the, the name, he's Greek, and he's actually he's on holiday at the moment, back in Greece, so trying to sort out the uh, economic crisis in Greece as well as uh, doing all the work that he does for the US Jockey Club as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat>